I have a good friend and actually my housemate for this last year down in Cambridge is called George and you can see him here actually he's in the vlog that appears he he appears throughout it he's the rowing coach very good friend of mine and George had a story to tell and this was that when I said that I was a, a YouTuber you know this was already last year this meme this story that he told me was a very moving one and it was of the four horsemen of the adpocalypse that you could not actually be a real YouTuber before you had ticked off these four most noble sponsorships that you had to get. And so it became my mission in life to get sponsorships from all of these different brands and that I would one day be a real YouTuber in my friend George's eyes. And today is that day, my friends. Oh yes, because today I can proudly say that this video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. So Raid Shadow Legends is a free-to-play role-playing turn-based game in which you enter the epic world of Telaria, where dark elves meet the Sacred Order and the Banner Lords who are fighting a constant war against the undead hordes. So you can collect, equip and train and then even upgrade your team of heroes in your journey that begins here. You can collect over 400 different champions that you can get by using shards. And what I really like about this is that there's lots of historical influence on the various champions. Some look like they're wearing Roman centurion helmets. Others have a bit more of a Greek aesthetic to them, but clearly some of the history has been looked at to inspire the, the graphics. And that's another thing that I really like is that it's really sort of fresh and new kind of graphics, especially for a mobile game. So let's go ahead and open out the shards in the portal. The thing in this game is that no matter if you get a good one or a bad one, they're still useful. If they are good ones, you can level them up and use them, and if they're bad ones, you can sacrifice them in order to level up your good champions. Now the first one is the Executioner. That one's rare. A very solid one and extremely helpful in most battles. Well, this one is definitely not a champion you would like to turn into food. Who'll be the next one? Ah, the Seducer. Oi oi, also a very rare one. I'll save him. Now for the last one. Oh, Mint. It's Scylla. I'm sure she'll come in usefully. You can challenge yourself to the edge in ongoing tournaments in which you can compete against the entire raid community while fighting the Spider's Dem, the Ice Golem's Peak, the Almighty Fire Knight or the Notorious Dragon in order to win awesome rewards and rare artifacts. The game is also available on PC having said that and actually if you go down to the description there's a special offer with special links for new players that you'll get 100,000 silver as well as two clan boss keys and 10 mystery shards as well as a free champion called the Executioner. Now all the treasure will be waiting for you there so I'll see you in Talari. as this video has been sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, I thought I'd talk about another raid but not a raid that occurred in a fantasy world of Talaria but in 1840 in Texas. Now at the time, Texas was still an independent republic. Of course, it would later join the United States, but at this point, it was still an independent republic of its own. Now the raid would... Oh, wait, that's face. As I was saying, the raid can be seen as the largest in US history. Even though Texas wasn't part of the US, it still counts as the largest if we do count Texas as being part of it. Now it occurred in 1840, and it was carried about by the Comanche tribe, who I mentioned in previous videos if you're interested in learning a little bit more about how they acquired horses, which made the attack possible. Now the pretext to this attack is that the Comanche had been raiding the settler frontier for quite a while before this, but that they'd come together with the Texans to try and work out some sort of peace negotiation. Now quite how up for that both of the parties were is subject to debate, but what happened at this meeting is that there were 12 Comanche chiefs that had come in to talk to the Europeans and to figure out some kind of deal, but that whatever transpired, the outcome was that all 12 of these were shot during this, that there was some kind of fight that broke out or whether it had been the plan all along is not entirely certain but it ended with them all being shot and killed and this became known as the council house fight in san antonio in texas and of course this led to a lot of resentment from the comanche because their leaders who had been sent there who had come there without the intention to fight against the europeans and to try and work things out in some ways whether that was why they had come is again not certain or if they were just trying to get gifts out of it in any case the comanche were very 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 angered by what had occurred. And so one Comanche leader, a leader of the Panataka brand, was called 
Buffalo Hump, and he came and he spoke to the Comanche after the council house fight had left 12 of their important leaders dead, and he rallied them. And the Comanche at this time, they were living in the area of the Texas Panhandle, so you can see in a map of Texas there, of course there are other states around where the Comanche would go because they obviously didn't recognize states because that was something that the United States, that was from their mindset rather than the Native American one uh, of the plains where they would just move around. And so Buffalo Hump united many of these peoples together and created a very large war band. And indeed, this was one of the largest war bands that would ever be created from the Comanche Nation. And might have been up to around 400 warriors with as many, if not more, women and children following along. Because, of course, a war band still needed people to do other tasks, obviously, like making fires, collecting firewood, cleaning things, cleaning weapons, healing men when they got sick. So often, Native American war bands from the plains would also have women and children that came along, and this was no exception. So in 1840, they set out from the Texas Panhandle region, and instead of attacking what they normally did, the settlement, the frontier, where the towns were prepared for Comanche attacks, they actually bypassed these completely and aimed to attack several of the settlements on the Texas and coast, so they travelled for hundreds of miles to get there. The trail of the war party was picked up by the Texas Rangers, but such a huge group of Native Americans moving towards the east couldn't be stopped by just this small group. And actually, before they had time to reach around and get more numbers to confront the war party, they broke off and attacked the town of Victoria on the Texan coast. They rode into the town and they killed up to a dozen of the townspeople, but they started to fire back with their weapons, and so the Comanche decided to to leave, but not before they had raided quite a number of horses and cattle, which is one of the things they were primarily interested in taking. The next town the war party laid their sights on, Linville, was even grander. It was the second largest coastal port town in all of Texas at the time. And they rode in again, unsuspecting the uh, the town folk were completely unsuspecting of them, and they rode in, but the town folk were actually able to get to safety after about a dozen of them were killed by getting onto a schooner, or a schooner as it's called in English one of the ships because of course the Comanche were from the, the central plains they had no idea of you know traveling over water particularly and so they were safe there and could only watch as the the town was was completely sacked by this Comanche war band now their main interest is was getting uh, horses because of course there were huge horse herds the Comanche possibly had one of the largest horse herds of any Native American tribe as I talked about as well as getting cattle which they slaughtered on the spot and then took the meat with them but they also had a lot of other things because actually in the town it was a, a port town and so there were a lot of exports and of course high society at the time things like top hats and umbrellas and actually there was a, a particular brand the Robinson brand that was taken from Linville and so you had lots of these Comanche that were going around with these captured umbrellas and top hats and all these kinds of things and they made up with an awful lot of them um, when, when they went away so there's potentially quite a comical sight of the the Native Americans obviously not for the townsfolk watching their town and their houses and their their hard and imports being paraded around but from the, the safety of the water, but they could only watch as the Native Americans were wearing the, the, these top hats and stealing these umbrellas and burning the town to the ground. Buffalo Hump's war party spent three days sacking Linville, which gave the Texas Rangers who'd been following them time to gather more numbers and so be a more effective fighting force if they were going to take on so many different warriors. And this ultimately culminated at the Battle of Plum Creek. Now it's called a battle, but really it's just the Comanche war party that was moving away with all the spoils. In fact, they had so many spoils. What they did was to take the beds from some of the houses and to use those as kind of sleds to tie them behind the mules and the horses and put all their stolen goods on there so they clearly weren't a very fast moving party normally they would be incredibly fast the comanche would disappear off into the desert and you know the texas rangers and whoever else were trying to chase them the u.s army later would have you know no success in finding them at all but they were really weighed down so really the battle of plum creek as it's often called was just these heavily laden with spoils comanche trying to escape from the texas rangers now the texas rangers claim that they killed 80 comanche the number is probably quite a bit lower because they only actually recovered 12 bodies so it's probably a little bit higher than that that they killed more and some were taken but really the Comanche got away because actually after killing a few of them the the Comanche left behind some of the horses and some of the goods and the Texas Rangers actually enriched themselves by then getting this stolen booty for themselves so the rest of the Comanche got away and you know they continued to be a thorn in the side of the Texans and the United States Army for many more decades after this and it was only in 1856 um, so 16 years after that the Penatica were brought onto a 
reservation by Buffalo Hunt. But, you know, for a long time after this, the other Comanche groups, the Panatica, were the Comanche band that lived the most to the east, so the closest to the encroaching settlers. The other Comanche bands, uh, for example, like the Quahadi, which was the band that the famous Quana Parker would go on to lead, would continue the resistance into the 1860s and 1870s. So anyway, I hope this video has been somewhat interesting. Um, I got this offer to do the, the sponsorship and of course to make George happy and also because it was good money, I won't lie to you, I, I decided to do the sponsorship but thought what's an interesting topic around raiding and raid that I can look at and I thought this 1840 great raid was quite an interesting one because it's the only time when you get a plains tribe like the Comanche actually coming and, and reaching the coast, you know, the east coast. It would It would be completely unheard of. Uh, for, for anything else so I thought it was an interesting one and also the more comical details in a way of, of them you know taking these top hats and umbrellas and then fleeing onto a ship and watching what was happening um, of course not comical for the people at the time you know lots of people died and were mistreated in brutal ways but that was the nature of warfare at the time anyway I hope you've enjoyed this one I have been Hilbert and this has been the history and if you did give me a thumbs up there'll be a discussion in the comments below as always and thank you for watching <laughs>